um, a little about Center for Wildlife Studies. So we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We're based here in Maine, but we work globally. So we provide specialized training um, to ecologists, conservation biologists, environmental scientists, wildlife biologists all over the world, right? So we offer these kinds of trainings to help them with their professional development. We also train people here in the community. We train people at colleges and universities. We do tons of work here in this country. And locally, we, we work in partnership with the Canada Public Library offering this program, Wild Maine. And the purpose of this program is to be able to educate folks about our amazing natural resources here in Maine and to let you know how you can get involved with stuff too. So many of the projects that we introduce here and that we have speakers come to talk about um, are projects that you can actually get involved with as well. So um, please learn more about us by going to Center for Wildlife Studies, uh, centerforwildlifestudies.org. Um, learn about us. These, these programs are free to the public. However, we are a 501c3, so we do appreciate donations. So learn about ways that you can give on our donations page. Um, with that said, I want to introduce Dr. Tristan Burgess. Um, this is a very special speaker tonight. He's actually the co-founder of Center for Wildlife Studies with myself. Um, we were actually uh, co-conspirators at, uh, at Unity College um, before we came here. Um, and he has, uh, he has worked tirelessly across the state working on marine mammal work, not just with otters, but he's involved in a response unit. We had a speaker here um, a, a few weeks ago that was talking about uh, marine mammal response in northern Maine. Well, he's responsible for marine mammal response in southern Maine. Um, he's an epidemiologist. Um, he was trained uh, here in this country as well as abroad. He's an, he's an Aussie. So he actually did his, his bachelor's in Australia, um, where he grew up, and then he ended up going and uh, doing his, his veterinarian work over at uh, Massey University in New Zealand. And then he finished off with a pinnacle degree, a PhD in, in epidemiology at, at UC Davis. Okay, so um, that's where I met him shortly after that at uh, Unity College. And now he is uh, involved in, in a number of things, including helping the world figure out how to stop spillover. So we just dealt with a major pandemic, right? We're gonna have others. And he is one of the on the ground conservationists now working with big organizations here in this world, trying to stop spillover from happening again. So today he's gonna talk about a critter that he studied during his PhD, he studied disease of marine, um, of, of otters uh, in the marine environment. He's going to talk to us a little bit about them here um, in the Northeast and, and anywhere else, I guess, that he's going to talk about. But anyway, let's welcome Tristan. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, well, thanks for that <clears throat> generous welcome. Uh, thanks, Jack, and thanks, Julia. And uh, thanks to all of you. Uh, for being here, a quick question. There's a red light on there that says mute. Does that mean I'm muted or not? It's not. It's it's flashing. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> First time here. Uh, so yeah, thanks for being here. It's great. Um, and yeah, I'm going to talk to you about sea otters. So I spend a lot of time working on other things uh, besides marine mammals, but I, I still love working with marine mammals and I still do it a bit, uh, maybe 10 or 15% of the time. So uh, I kind of pick, pick this talk uh, title just to be, you know, it seemed like it seemed like a nice question to ask about sea otters. And what I, I guess what I'm really going to talk about more is something that we sometimes think about in the evenings after, you know, feel like is it seemed to us like more than their fair share of discoveries about the way the world works seemed to go on in places where people were studying sea otters. It seemed like there were too many. And so I'm just sort of explore why that is. I mean, are there really a lot, did we, have we really learned a lot of fundamental things about ecology from studying sea otters? And if so, what were they and, and why? So it's really what have sea otters done for science, I guess. Uh, so <clears throat> I often start out with what is a sea otter and also what isn't a sea otter. Um, we were just talking earlier, right, about uh, people who come up to you and say, oh, I saw a sea otter in, in you know, Belfast or in Camden or anywhere else in Maine. And we're pretty confident you didn't see a sea otter in Maine because there aren't any sea otters in Maine. <laughs> so I am very much stretching the definition of wild Maine here 
uh, by talking to you about an animal that definitely doesn't live in Maine at all. <laughs> Uh, it doesn't even live on this side of the country, but it does live in North America. Um, and I, I probably should have given you a nice range map, but I didn't. But they live from Southern California, uh, right up through most of the coast of California to about San, just south of San Francisco. And uh, they also live uh, from about the middle of Washington, all the way up through Southeast Alaska, all the way to Japan, basically across the Aleutian Islands. You'll see a map of the Aleutian Islands in a minute. So this is an exclusively marine creature, the smallest marine mammal, exclusively marine mammal. Um, and we've all seen them, right? I mean, everyone's seen a picture, a video of a sea otter feeding, breaking open a clam and eating it. Maybe they're holding hands or something like that. They're actually much less cute in person than, uh, than they are on TikTok, I can assure you. Um, but they are cool. Uh, but they're not just a pretty face. They're quite an interesting animal. And we're going to talk about some of the weird and interesting things about sea otters uh, today uh, as we go through this process. Just click off this thingy over here. Yeah. <clears throat> so let's look. We have to do it. Messed it up. On oh, Avery. Uh, yeah. oh, oh, we're back. Okay. We're back in business. Okay, thanks. Magic touch. <laughs> so we're going to start um, our journey uh, in the Aleutian Islands. Um, although, actually, we very nearly never get there. So we're really going to start the journey in a college gymnasium in Spokane, Washington, <laughs> instead, um, where a 21-year-old James A. Estes, a uh, recent master's graduate from Washington State, uh, reported draft card in hand, uh, fully expecting to be drafted and shipped off to Vietnam in pretty short order after a perfunctory physical exam. Uh, but as it happens, a certain Dr. Sanchez didn't like the sound of a popping noise coming out of his right knee uh, and marked him 4F, not fit for service. So Jim went to the bar to celebrate, and then the next one he had to figure out what to do next. So, oh, Jim, there we are. I've got to show the picture. Jim, Jim Estes. So, so he did. And at this point, enter the AEC. The, uh, this is the Atomic Energy Commission. So... This is early 1970. The, the Atomic Energy Con Commission is thinking about uh, planning a new nuclear test. Uh, this is the height of the Cold War. They'd been testing nuclear weapons in the South Pacific, uh, in Nevada, and they wanted to test a new and larger nuclear device, and they picked Amchika Island, in their wisdom. Uh, and uh, by the way, by this as well, it's really by 68, 69, they're making this decision, right? And by this point, nuclear testing was becoming controversial. There was a certain amount of opposition to it, concern uh, over various things. Some people believed it was going to cause a tidal wave, tsunami, uh, maybe trigger another earthquake. They had a big, a big earthquake in Alaska in the mid-60s that was put that in a lot of people's minds. But there was also concern about the impact that might have on wildlife, right? And, and things like sea otters. Mm -hmm. So they were under a fair amount of pressure to justify, you know, that this wasn't going to be destructive or harmful. And they, they made the decision, okay, we're going to do a lot of ecological monitoring. And they started up this ecological monitoring program in the Aleutians. And uh, so that's where our sea otter enters the story. Now, into Vince Schultz. So Vince Schultz is a professor at Washington State, occasional consultant to the AEC. And... Uh, <clears throat> The AEC had become dissatisfied with the work of their main contractor who'd started working on this, this biological monitoring. It was Battelle, actually, was still a big you know, federal contractor to this day. And they, they wanted to move to a new model of maybe, okay, maybe let's just send young guys out there who can live in the field instead of short cruises, big teams, expensive work in a short period of time. Let's just send a few young guys out of the field and uh, you know, keep them there right, uh, do it differently. And they asked Vince if he knew anyone and he vouched uh, for a, a young, uh, much younger than this, Jim Estes, and said, yeah, like, give this guy a shot. Now they weren't willing to hire him directly, but they, uh, they, he had a chat with a few people and they ultimately ended up coming up with an arrangement with a professor at University of Arizona to 
you know, contract the university, they'll send Jim, and, and off he went. Pretty soon he was on a plane to, to M. Chitko. Um, so when he got there, uh, you know, he was a young and curious guy, and he was thinking about doing a PhD. He was a scientist, a naturalist, and but he didn't really know what he was doing uh, in, in the specific in terms of his scientific career, uh, but he wanted to study sea otters. He was interested, his supervisor was interested in studying sea otters. And he explored a few blind tunnels and tried a few things out. Some of them went dreadfully. He tried to catch and tag sea otters. That was pretty much a debacle because um, no one had done it. No one knew how to do it. Uh, nothing against Jim, he, great, great guy, great scientist. But you know, when you try and catch an animal for the first time, you don't know how to do it. So, uh, did some physiology research for a while, but ultimately, um, after a while, he was like, gee, I don't know, I, I'm having a hard time. And he, he ran into another graduate student who, uh, was working for, um, there we are, Bob Payne. Um, who's a, a, a pretty well-known figure into tidal ecology. And Jim was a bit, a bit reticent about talking to this, you know, great figure in intertidal ecology. Uh, but ultimately he said, okay, 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 I'll sit down and have a, you know, have a chat with, uh, with Bob and we'll talk it over. So just to give you a bit of an idea. So here's, so this is, um, this is what's called a fam an academic family tree. And this is all the people Bob Payne supervised and all the people, all their students. So everyone's students, students. So that's really, I mean, obviously you can't read half of this. I'm breaking one of my cardinal rules about slides. Never show a slide you can't read. You don't need to read this one. What you can see is that he trained a lot. Oh, that was exciting. He trained a lot of productive people. Um, you can see Jane Lubchenco's name there, former NOAA director, and also a kind of a legendary lab at Oregon State. So, so Bob was a big, kind of a big deal in intertidal ecology and a very smart guy. And he, you know, sat down with Jim and Jim was like, well, look, I, I'm really having a hard time with this. You know, I'm, you know, I'm, it's interesting being on the island, seeing all this stuff, but developing a research question to understand how kelp forests affect sea otters. You know, I'm having a hard time with it. And Bob said, well, have you thought about studying how sea otters affect kelp forests? He thought, oh, well, that's an interesting question. And so he started thinking about that. And um, I might sound like, you know, kind of glib and like, whatever, well, you, you just turn it around backwards, right? Does that, that's, is that so smart? But <clears throat> at this time, you know, this kind of direction thing actually makes a huge difference. And at that time, almost all ecology and especially marine ecology, everyone was all about bottom up is what we call it, right? So everything was pretty much... The prevailing wisdom was that primary productivity, plants, algae, working their way up to things, that, to herbivores, to carnivores, was really where it was at. That was how marine ecosystems are driven and assembled, was bottom up. So very few people really at that time believed that animals at the top of the food chain really mattered much to what an ecosystem looks like. and. But Bob had done a bunch of experimental work on sea stars in Washington, removing sea stars from uh, intertidal zones like tide pools and, and rocks and, and watching what happened. And he had observed that it made a big difference if you took away these sea stars, which is kind of an apex predator in that tide pool situation. So he was a, an early believer in the idea that predators matter. So, so he, that was the first thing he thought of. So Jim thought, well, okay, I've been on this island where there's loads of sea otters and a nice kelp forest and everything. Let's go to an island where there aren't any sea otters. And what he saw was very stark. Now, probably many of you have seen or heard of something similar before. Now, so with sea, oh, I can't control my buttons. <laughs> so with sea otters, right, loads of kelp. Well, this is Amchika, where he started out. He flew over to Shemya, which is an island with no sea otters. That's all he saw. Barren seafloor covered in urchins. Ah, that's different. So pretty, it didn't take very long 
uh, to realize there was something going on here. And that was enough to get, you know, Jim and, and this graduate student that badgered him into talking to Bob Payne, um, a paper in science, which is not that easy to do uh, in 1974. Uh, but basically what they, and I took this, actually, this is not from the paper, this picture is from, from a textbook, from an undergrad ecology textbook, which is where you find this stuff now, right? But in 1974, you did not. So what they found was what we've, Many of us have maybe heard about in a you know, news article or an undergrad ecology course where you had loads of sea otters. You didn't have many urchins, but you had lots of kelp. Over on Shemya, no sea otters, hadn't been sea otters in 100 years. All you had was barrel loads of urchins and basically no kelp. Uh, so this seems kind of basic to us who've heard it before. But at the time, it was kind of a big deal. Uh, and this came to, be called, came to be called the trophic cascade, where you see lots of something. I'm really, I should just burn this thing. Um, <laughs> you see lots of something, right? Lots of predators in this instance. Lots of these guys, not many of these guys. Lots of these guys, alternating. Lots, not many. Lots, not many, right? We call it a trophic cascade. And it, becomes, it sounds kind of nerdy. But it's kind of it's become a pretty massive concept in ecology and it's been found in lots of places um, and it's quite a popular thing to, to sort of observe and write about you might have also seen um, an article called landscapes of fear talking about wolves being reintroduced to yellowstone another sort of classic case study of a trophic cascade um, so and this was this is where it came from right this is the first one uh, that we know of, that anyone ever discovered and, and coined this term was trophic cascades and sea otters, urchins, and kelp uh, near Lucian Islands. But, uh, you know, you need more than two islands or at least more than two study sites to really figure this stuff out. So let's, uh, let's maybe try and replicate this. So this is kind of the, the nerdy section of the talk for the next 10 minutes. Um, there'll be a couple of graphs, sorry about that. Um, but, uh, you know, another big topic in ecology at this same time was do ecosystems have different states that they can switch between? Some people reckoned that was possible. Some didn't. It was kind of a, it was one of those topics that people, you know, professors argued about over a whiskey or maybe wrote opinion pieces about in journals at this time. But there was no conclusive evidence one way or the other. You know, you had a few people proposing different theories about whether there were or were not or could be or could not be these sort of flips in an ecosystem from one state to another. And a big, uh, another sort of leading ecology figure at the time, Robert McCarthy, he was pretty influential. He suggested, it was in a pretty, a pretty small journal paper that I just found purely by chance, actually, looking for patterns in relatively homogeneous so similar habitats that are of a size just large enough to hold an adequate sample of species. So look for a place where you get lots of replica ecosystems, basically, was his advice. Um, so lots of places that are really quite similar. They're big enough to have multiple species. They're not just, you know, size of this room, right? They're big enough to have a full suite of species, but small enough that you can round up 20 or 30 or 40 of them and study them. Um, and the first ever demonstration of alternate stable states in an ecosystem was an experimental one at the Beaufort, uh, sorry, the Duke Marine Lab in Beaufort, North Carolina. But this was on, you know, one, one square foot ceramic tiles, purely experimental. And, you know, cool, but it had never been seen in nature before until um, Jim and the rest of that research group went, started gathering data on kelp and urchins and sea otters at a ton of sites. I haven't labeled them. You don't really need to label them. Don't worry about it. <laughs> right across the Aleutians, Southeast Alaska and Canada. Tried to replicate the study they did on Amchitka and Shemya. Let's go lots more islands, just like MacArthur said. Now, I don't know if, if Jim ever read that paper. I should ask him, actually, if MacArthur's one. I don't know if he ever heard that advice, but it came out the same year as the science paper. Um, but he wasn't really studying alternate stable states. He wasn't thinking about that. 
he was thinking about well, what 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 are sea otters matter for? Do they control ecosystems? Do they do anything to the, to kelp forests? Right, and the answer was yeah, right. Basically, <laughs> lots of yes on this one. So wherever you had loads of kelp, you know, you didn't have urchins. We had loads of urchins. You didn't have kelp, and that pattern held right across, at least as far as Canada. Um, <clears throat> so okay, well that was cool. So this actually, you know, looking back in hindsight, no one wrote this in the paper, but in hindsight, we're notching up another win for the scientific productivity of sea otters in that there was the first real world natural demonstration uh, of alternate stable states. So the, but the real test, right, came when, um, when you started losing sea otters. So in... From about, so this is, let's see here. Okay, this is where we were starting to do the work on Amchitka and Shemya, 70, 71, 72, okay? So at that time, there were loads of sea otters on Amchitka and quite a number of the Aleutian Islands. Some, like Shemya, were down here. They still didn't have them, right? But in the following 20 years, 20, 25 years, all the Aleutian sea otter populations crashed. 90% of them were gone by the mid 90s. I don't really knew why initially, but the aerial survey data was pretty conclusive. Like island after island, the otters were either gone or almost all of them were gone. Hmm. So there were lots of questions <laughs> circling about why that was, and there were lots of theories. Um, Thinking of it's wrong. Um, at least in the Aleutian Islands, in California, it's probably right. Uh, but one of the theories uh, initially that just popped up when people were sitting on these Aleutian Islands, they sent more. They sent some more research cruisers out in the nineties because of this to try and figure out why. Um, including one of my PhD supervisors collected a bunch of infectious disease samples. People like Jim and Jim, Bod Jim Bodkin from USGS. A number of other people were looking for, you know, trophic explanations, predation, disease, starvation, what was going on, right? So a lot of different people were working on different theories to explain why sea otters are gone. Um, I think we'll fully answer that question today, but we'll, we'll use it as a tool to understand the rest of our science for sure. So let's start with what definitely happened. So what definitely happened is some sea otters got eaten by killer whales. Uh, what definitely happened is almost all of the islands lost their sea otters, got over, overrun by urchins, and all the kelp disappeared. That part we know for sure. Now, what this, for, for the nerdy scientists among us, what this did is tell us that, yeah, okay, that tropic cascade thing, that was real. Um, number two, what it told us is that these ecosystems can actually be tipped over the edge and converted from kelp forest to urchin barren pretty easily. That can happen. So we do have this whole alternate stable state thing happening. Um, and this is the this is the most probably the most uh, data nerdy slide we've got here. Um, this is the ecologists call this hysteresis, which is basically when it takes so here. Once everyone accepted that there was such a thing as an alternate stable state, people said, well, is it just, is it just a knife edge? Do you go this way or you go this way? Or actually, is it hard to push things across a mountain? And actually, you have to work really hard to get them over and down the other side. So people started, because people wanted to ask, are there conservation and management implications to that thing? Like, is it really hard to either destroy an ecosystem and convert it into something we don't want it to? Or conversely, is it easy to push it back, right, to, to restore an ecosystem? Or is it once you've degraded it, can you never get it back? So people want to know is, you know, what controls this switch from one state to another and how hard is it to push it across? And so what they found by observing these Aleutian Islands, both during the crash 
and after the crash was that it's actually much easier to destroy a kelp forest than it is to fix one. Um, it only takes six sea otters per square per linear kilometer of coastline, about six sea otters per kilometer to maintain a kelp forest takes twice that to rebuild one, mm. which is inconvenient, but interesting. Um, the other thing we learned is that restoring a kelp forest, at least in this part of the world, have been the Aleutians sort of from Southeast Alaska on across to Russia, you virtually can't do it without a sea otter. There's no other animal that fills that hole uh, of controlling urchins. Uh, and it, in so doing, sea otters became the first sort of naturally occurring proof of a concept that Bob, again, Bob Payne, here he is again, my series of um, old, old guys pointing at stuff, photos. <laughs> uh, you coined this term keystone species, which mm. many of you have probably heard that word, right? May have even heard a sea otter called one, maybe. Uh, so it's, this is a species without which both your ecosystem may either collapse or, or fundamentally change, at least. And you can't rebuild it without it. Right, you can't just let the kelp forest grow back and then the, and then the grazers come in. This doesn't naturally reassemble itself unless you have sea otters, right? So in that context, they're they're the keystone because the whole thing doesn't stay up without sea otters, and so they were the first sort of naturally occurring demonstration. Bob coined the term in the context of his experimental work on sea stars. Uh, now, in other places, people like to generalize. People love to overgeneralize stuff. If you look down in California, you can actually support a kelp forest without sea otters because there are other predators that do the job. In some cases, rockfish, uh, sunflower sea stars, until they died of wasting seas, um, spidey lobsters, right? There are some other urchin predators. But up north, beyond sort of Vancouver Island, you better have a sea otter or you're not going to have a kelp forest. So here's where we get to what meh, maybe happened, but maybe didn't, but it was kind of interesting and it made a bit of a splash. So I'm just going to talk a, bit, a little bit about it, but I don't know if it's fact. So this paper, you may have heard the phrase fishing down the food chain. If you read about fisheries or sustainable seafood, it came from this 1998 science paper. And don't worry too much about the graph. Really what it's showing, I should have come up with a better picture to, to describe this. But uh, what they did is they, they gathered fisheries data for, you know, the, pretty much the whole second half of the 20th century at that point and looked at, were these animals high trophic level predators that we were fishing and eating or were they lower level, more like intermediate or herbivorous fish? And what they found is that over the course of the 20th century, people had been gradually eating less and less big predatory fish and more and more lower level on the food chain species, uh, basically because we'd been fishing out the big predatory fish and their abundance was just declining. And so they would go on the swordfish and the tuna just weren't there in the levels they used to be. And so they coined this term fishing down the food chain, eating at the top, 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 just working your way down. So that's what people were doing, right? And, you know, you can see it kind of happened over the whole course of that second half of the 20th century in marine, started a little later, maybe in the 70s for freshwater fish. Um, and that actually twigged a few people who study megafauna, marine megafauna, whales, dolphins, seals, sea otters, to think, I wonder if that's what's happening with marine mammals. Because a lot of people who studied marine, large marine predators, had noticed that over the course of the 20th century, at least in the North Pacific, most of their populations had collapsed at some point. And some people put these pieces of the puzzle together to say, well, hang on, what if somebody's fishing down the food chain of marine mammals? And there aren't many animals that eat a lot of marine mammals. There's only a handful, but one of them is killer whales. And so the theory was hatched based on a bunch of physiological measurements and observations of when these population declines happened, 
that killer whales had been eating uh, a lot of large whales historically. But when they were depleted by whaling, that option was off the table and they started eating other things like harbor seals. But the biomass, the available harbor seals, there was nowhere near as many. Like the amount of tons of great whale in the North Pacific was huge, right? The number of tons of harbor seal that are available to eat way less. So if killer whales were started switching to eating them, they're going away. And then they'll switch to the next one, switch to the next one. And at some point they get to the, the least desirable and least nutritious and least delicious uh, marine mammal, which is the sea otter. Did that really happen? I don't know. The evidence is circumstantial. Uh, it, when it came out, when that paper came out, there was a lot of oh, I don't know, a lot of a lot of angry rebuttal and responses, a lot of a lot of nerdy scientist fights over that one. Um, it was interesting. Uh, I think it's true. I think the evidence is compelling that killer whales played a role in sea otter, the sea otter collapse in the Aleutians. Um, whether the rest of it, the fishing down the food chain of, of killer whales eating marine mammals, I don't know. There are probably other explanations, but it was interesting. So, all right, let's leave the illusions behind because I haven't done any work yet at this point, right? Um, I, I finished high school, I'm probably an undergrad at this point, but I, I haven't done any work yet myself. So we're now gonna move forward uh, a number of years and uh, to a whole new era of sea otter research. We're not in the seventies anymore. We have new techniques for studying individual sea otters. This here is a Wilson trap. Uh, if we have time later, I can show you a video of it in action. Uh, so that's that, this, this little nice little basket. This is how you catch a sea otter. So you've got this metal basket attached to the front of a dive scooter. Now you're gonna dive in here, the closed circuit rebreather, no bubbles. You can't see any bubbles there, right? Uh, and we'll catch sea otters and it works. Uh, it took a while for people to figure that out, but we get them in hand, uh, we can capture them, sample them. We can now follow individual animals throughout their life and learn all about uh, their individual life stories, what they do, what they eat. Uh, and uh, we give them gifts. So each sea otter gets, that we catch gets a time depth recorder that records their dive so we can see how deep they dive and for how long. And they get a VHF radio so we can find them again quite easily. And our highly trained team of spotters can watch, watch them to see what they're doing. Um, now, just watching sea otters for many years is uh, surprisingly valuable, as it turns out. So we're no longer in the Aleutians, we're in California now. So much more accessible coastline, uh, much you know, e easier environment to work in. And uh, you can send people out to a clifftop and they will watch sea otters for you without being paid, uh, which is very useful. Uh, and so now having you know, gathered, I sort of came in on the tail end of this and benefited from you know, a 15 year trove of behavioral observation data, um, which we can now use to, we can just look at a time depth recorder trace for a couple of months of a sea otter's life and we can tell you exactly what it was doing. We can pick out shark attacks, uh, mating events, conception. We can pick out birth. We can pick out weaning. We can pick out when they lose a pup. We can pick out uh, what they're eating, what type of food, what percentage of their diet is clams, right? Uh, how much energy they get. Uh, all of that because we got a whole bunch of years and years of behavioral observations, people watching and writing down what they did and what they ate simultaneous with that dive data. Uh, we put those together for enough years, you can do that. So a whole different, uh, whole different era uh, of work now uh, based on this, okay? So you can even, based on that, if you, get, if you take enough sea otters now, you can look at you know, 20, 30, 50 sea otters just from looking at the number of hours those animals spend foraging I can tell you what the shellfish community looks like in the place where those otters live. Because uh, their dive behavior changes completely in response to the availability of different types of food. So we also test them for various things that might be harming them. So there's been concern for a number of years over the status of California's sea otter population. Is it growing fast enough? Is it declining? Are they all being eaten by sharks? Are they all dying of infectious disease? 
So there's a lot of different research avenues going on. So we might be testing this as a delightful parasite here we're testing for. Um, and this is actually what I did my PhD on, uh, this lovely parasite. Um, so you may, you may not have heard of this parasite by name, but you've probably, many of you at least, may have heard the, that if you're pregnant, you probably shouldn't clean out a litter box. And that's why this parasite is the reason. It's also the reason sea otters shouldn't eat snails, as we'll soon learn. So, <clears throat> but we can see this is, this is coming from the land. So this is a parasite that lives only in cats. Well, it breeds only in cats. Mm -hmm. So you might ask, well, what are the chances of it finding its way to a sea otter? You'd think maybe not, not very high. You'd think. Uh, well, over the last 20 years, quite a, quite a lot of effort, kind of a remarkable amount of effort, has been poured into answering that question uh, and figuring out why. Uh, and so many of us have taken a, a piece of this, you know, one, one or two of these arrows and studied it extensively for many years uh, to try and figure out, well, is this happening? Is that happening? Is actually there something else going on? You know, some people might be sampling sea lions and, ah, maybe, maybe it's secretly in sea lions. And we didn't know. No, no, cross that one off the list, right? So we spent a lot of time studying, you know, why sea otters get this, partly because they're unique and interesting. And it actually proved to be a very fruitful animal to study this process in for a couple of reasons. So over the years, one dead end after another was crossed off and everyone resigned themselves to the fact that actually this is what is happening. We've got a parasite that's coming out of cats or mountain lions or bobcat, getting into fresh water, washing out to sea, and somehow finding a sea otter and making it pretty sick, actually, in a number of cases. They don't all die, certainly, but a certain percentage of them do, and the rest get sick, or well, some of the rest. But at this point, we still don't know how they're getting it. But there are a few, a few uh, breadcrumbs to follow. Uh, so a pathologist friend of mine had found when she did her PhD that here, rivers, fresh water were more likely to be sick. Uh, my PhD advisor found when she did her PhD that consumption of a diet high in marine snails was a risk factor. Here's a marine snail, the kelp frond. We'll see a better picture of it in a minute. Um, okay, snails, huh? So we're still left with this question. How does this tiny little egg, size of a red blood cell, smaller actually, find its way to a sea otter in the ocean. And also, why do snails? What's up with that? Why do they matter? Um, so I'm actually going to look at here. Let's look at the slides. So it turns out what's happening. This is a slide. You can kind of ignore the top. The top, oh, geez. The top is another blind avenue that was explored for quite a while and turned out not to be particularly important. The bottom turned out to be highly important. So what we have on the bottom is here's our little infectious egg-like, they're called oocysts, but basically eggs, right? Parasite, infectious little things. They're in the water and they flow out into the ocean. It turns out, if you've ever touched kelp, you know it's kind of slimy, right? Um, the technical term is transparent exopolymer, but it's slimy stuff, right? It's sticky, uh, especially when wet and the oocysts stick to the surface. So the kelp acts kind of like a filter, except the sea otter lives in the filter. And you know, who else lives in the filter is the snail. So these little marine snails live on the surface of kelp blades and they feed there. Here's a picture of one. This is, you can see a little better here, right? Uh, it's got this little raspy tongue that it scrapes off the surface and it sort of just scrapes all that slime off the surface of the uh, kelp and eats that. But guess what else is in the slime? Mm. So these little eggs are in there. They're getting concentrated into the snails and they stay there for a couple of weeks. So they could be hundreds of them in there. A friend of mine did the experimental work to find out just how long. And the answer is 10 to 14 days. Uh, and the other problem with snails is they're really small. They're only this big. 
So a sea otter has to eat a ton of them. So even if not very many of them are infected, eating snails is a problem. Now, two things. Sea otters have to eat a lot. So do I cover this? Yeah, let's talk about it now. So sea otters are strange little creatures. They're the smallest marine mammal, as I said before, and consequently, they get cold easy. So every other marine mammal lives in what almost its entire life in what's called a thermal neutral zone, which means it doesn't need to do much work to stay warm or cool. I think my analogy for this is your house. How many people lit their wood stove today? How many people ran their air conditioner today? Right, your house is in its thermal neutral zone. It's a very comfortable temperature. You don't need to do anything. You don't need to burn any energy to heat or cool your house on a day like today. That's life for a beluga or a California sea lion or a blue whale. It doesn't need to burn extra energy to stay warm or cool. It has all the insulation that it needs to just stay warm without lifting a finger. A sea otter isn't like that. They're kind of an incompletely adapted marine mammal. They have some really cool adaptations. Don't get me wrong. Their fur is amazing. But they have to run their wood stove 365 days a year, but they burn abalone or snails instead of wood, right? They're constantly burning copious amounts of energy just to avoid freezing to death all the time. And they get all their energy from shellfish. So they eat a vast amount of food, way more than you'd expect for their size. Uh, about a quarter of their body weight every day, a third if they're pregnant or lactating. So that leads us uh, to our scorekeeping slide. So, okay, what did we do here? We talked about trophic cascades. They helped us out a lot with that. Thank you, sea otters. Um, they help demonstrate in the real world the keystone species occurring naturally in its environment. Yes. Okay. They helped with another key question in the uh, late sort of mid to late 20th century ecology about alternate stable states and can you push ecosystems from one state to another. Um, and they helped us out a lot with pathogen pollution, studying diseases uh, that move from land to sea. Why are they so? Why have they done these things for us? Well, I, I kind of boil it down to these three things. They're interesting animals. I don't just mean they're interesting to people like me or you. Um, I mean that they are unusual. They do some odd things and they're kind of a misfit compared to a lot of their compatriots. That whole issue of being incompletely adapted and burning so much energy, right? They're unusual in that way. Uh, they also, you know, um, you know, they're inherently interesting to people uh, to the point that people will watch them for nothing, which is very useful. Um, that people are willing to pour hours and hours into watching uh, and making copious and very systematic notes about sea otters. You know, there are paid staff, maybe supervising volunteers. There could be 100 volunteers out there, you know, on the California coastline watching sea otters, um, collecting that data. Uh, fewer now, but in the, in the, you know, the peak of that, the heyday of that program, there could have been 100 out there on a given day. Um, and so, so it's incredibly labor intensive to get that kind of data. And it would be so expensive if you if you could have to do it all with paid staff. So the fact that they are interesting to people actually is, I think, a big chunk of why we've learned so much from studying them, that people are willing to do that. Um, so they're interesting animals. They do interesting things like eat so much. Uh, they also are very handy. They, they also are... Um, very helpful in bringing all their food to the surface and showing it to us. Um, it's partly because they're, again, incompletely adapted. They can't really handle their prey underwater. They have to bring it up, put it on the table, and work on it, right? Which is really great for us because we get to see it and write down what it was, okay? They also, they can't live, although they live all the time, almost all the time in the water, they can't live out in the open ocean. Uh, because they have to eat so much, about 100 miles is about the biggest stretch of open water a seal can cross without starving to death in the process. They can't go far without stopping to eat. So they're stuck close to shore where we can see them. That makes it easy to stay with them. And uh, they also kind of live, they live in interesting places. Uh, 
So they live on places like the Aleutians, which are these handy replica islands. There's, you know, lots of Aleutian islands. They're all very similar. Um, they also live in places like the linear coast of California, which is kind of easy to study because you can sort of draw a line down the coast, number it out, and actually it's, it, it makes your life really easy when you're doing things like spatial analysis if you have this simple coastline to work with. Um, they also live in, we think of kelp forests, I think, well, maybe I'm, maybe it's just me. I think kelp forests is fascinating, but they're kind of simple in terms of the number of species that live there. There's actually not a ton of species that occur in large numbers in a kelp forest. Um, so if Jim had gone to California, he might not have made the same, twig to the same things about sea otters as early uh, because there are more other species that fill in extra niches, like the sunflower stars and the rockfish and the spiny lobsters. Up in the Aleutians, it's just sea otters that fill that predator niche. So it's kind of a simple system. So they live in this interesting, simple system that is really good for science. You know, it's hard to do science in complex systems. You can do it, but it's really hard. Doing science in simple systems, that's why we have labs. That's why you have lab experiments, because you simplify everything and get down to these, like, simple binary questions. So living in these sort of simplified ecosystems, uh, as they often do, is, I think, a big chunk of why they're also so productive and helpful for us. So that's all I got for you. Um, Hope that was interesting. Hope this, the, uh, the the graphs weren't too much. And um, yes, lots of um, many acknowledgements. And actually, this is nowhere near enough. This is really only acknowledgements related to the um, work that I personally did. So obviously, all that stuff we learned about Seattle's over the past 50 to 100 years, obviously, I can't list all the people that contributed to that. There were many. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to thank uh, you all for being here. Thank the Camden Library for having us, uh, with the sponsoring this series. And uh, if you have any questions, now is the time. I hope I'm not over time. No, you're good. Thank you so much. Yeah, anyone uh, on Zoom also has questions, you can type them into the chat or the Q&A, and I'll read them out loud. Uh, but Please. So as you've talked about the Aleutian Islands and all the years of study, how is it now with its stability? Still have sea otters or some? There are some signs. Of, I'm told super closely, but I believe there are areas where there are some signs of recovery in so in some of the islands. Mostly, I forget where the line is. Um, basically, the really the, the the really near islands in the uh, it's not not the near islands, which is a confusing name, but the ones that are really near to the Alaskan Alaskan coast, like Kodiak Island, for example, has a pretty robust population now. Um, and Southeast Alaska, you know, very uh, dense and, you know, increasing extremely rapidly. But most of the Aleutians in the main chain, very low populations still. Um, the only places you still see them are very shallow sheltered coves where we think killer whales can't get in and get them. Um, you know, most of those islands are either depopulated or mostly so um, to this day, I believe. So if, if there's no sea otter around here, what is it that we see around here that look just like sea Good otters? Good question. Uh, most probably uh, river otters, but some river otters do forage in the sea. I've seen them in Belfast, down in the water. Um, so there are plenty of marine foraging river otters here and in a number of other places. Um, they're very common in the Pacific Northwest to see them in the ocean, um, sheltered, you know, in sheltered marine waters. They don't like to be out in the surf so much but sheltered marine waters, just like we have here, I wouldn't be at all surprised to see him. I haven't personally seen one in Camden, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if I did. Yeah, um, families are among us, bro. Yeah, mm, I believe it. Yeah, yes, yeah, so people often say, oh, I saw sea otters, and yeah, so those are, and they're, they're really fun to see, but yeah, that's the American river otter, um, in all, all likelihood. Unless it was really small, and then it could have been a mink or a muskrat. It's an actual otter, you know, yeah, river otter, yeah. Um, I have a question. Uh, is so when there was the population crash in those Aleutian Islands, it was pretty certain that they were dying, not that they were like moving somewhere else. Is Good question. Right? Good question. So that was one of the many things they have to figure out. Like, so when you 
you know, when you when you try to figure out a problem like this, you don't know even the fundamentals of what has happened. What you just usually what you get is an observation of one or two things. You get an observation of lots of dead animals, or you get an observation that hey, there aren't any animals there anymore. Mm. Um, in this case, it was largely a lack of animals, right? But basically, uh, in the Aleutian Islands, there's nowhere to go mm. that a sea otter can go, right? Mm. There are other neighboring islands, and they can occasionally cross some of those channels. But if all the islands are empty, you know they're not doing that. Right. And sea otters are not swimming across the Pacific and like cutting down to California. They're just not physically capable of doing it, you know. Um, they sort of work their way across that chain at some point. Um, but some of the some of the passes are like pretty easy and they can cross them back and forth. But some of the other paths passes are, are much wider and very rarely crossed um, because it's a really difficult thing to to, to survive, you know, um, especially if kill whales eat them. But even without that, just just energetically, it's it's tough for them to swim 50, 60 miles in open water. That's that's really, really pushing it for a sea otter. Yeah. Any reintroduction programs? Um, yeah, there's well, there's most there's more talk than action. Big how unusual. Um, <laughs> but there's there's per perennial talk of a, another reintroduction in Oregon. So they did, you know, historically otters lived from Baja, California, continuously all the way around to Japan. Uh, but they were wiped out off over big chunks of their range. And actually, we most people thought they were wiped out even in California, but there was a, a holdout population um, in Big Sur, which at the time didn't have a road. Um, this is 1917. I think they discovered the remnant population in Big Sur. And I go, Look at that. When they started building a road through there, they're like, oh, look at that. There are some sea otters hiding out here. Um, but, you know, we're talking 20, maybe survived or so. Uh, anywho, they've expanded up to a point in California, but that's pretty much stalled out. Yeah. There's one reinter there's one translocation program in California to San Nicolas Island, which is one of those islands off the shore of California. It had a weird kind of actually it started from relocating animals that were that, that fishermen had complained about um, uh, trashing crab pots and stuff like that. And they had, you know, fisheries interaction animals, basically, that they would take out and put them on San Nicolas Island. Mm -hmm. and they did really badly for 10 years. And they were just about to pull the plug on the program when they suddenly, for some reason, started, you know, breeding independently. And now that population is on the way up. But it really had a hard time getting started. Mm -hmm. I don't really know why. Mm -hmm. um, it might have been the animals that they took or... I mean, the sex ratio wasn't bad, but I don't know. Anyway, they, they had a really hard time getting started, but they got there. The original Oregon, they introduced them into Oregon. I think it was in the 70s, but don't quote me on that, but quite a while ago, and that failed. Mm -hmm. um, they all died out, but the Washington era introduction did great. Yeah. Um, and whether that was genetic, they were not well adapted to that environment. They took the wrong otters and put them in Oregon. They couldn't get by. Whether the habitat wasn't good, I don't know. We don't really know why that introduction didn't go well, but it didn't. But there is renewed talk of maybe doing it. Um, there's also lots of places where there are sea otters are reintroducing their own selves. Uh, so a friend of mine did his master's in, in Glacier Bay in uh, Alaska, which is pretty pretty cool place to be um super interesting scientifically because the glaciers have, re have receded out of this bay and just opened it up and so they got to observe firstly all the marine things colonizing it and then about 15 years later sea otters got there and turned the entire system upside down again um by just vacuuming up every uh available shellfish that they like to eat um so they're you know throughout southeast alaska british columbia they're spreading very fast and, and some places are kind of taking a proactive approach to this uh, um on haida gwaii which is a big island off the west coast of canada further north than vancouver island kind of halfway to alaska um the tribal government there is taking kind of a proactive approach to planning and figuring out how are we going to manage sea otters? Because they're coming probably within the next 10, 15 years, they're going to arrive uh, on like some of these, you know, places. And now they're there, right? And so they're sort of planning what to do and how to manage sea otters in a proactive way, which is kind of interesting because they're, they're just reintroducing themselves uh, to all these places. Um, yeah. We have some questions on Zoom. Please. Um, 
Christina asks, how specifically are river otters impacted by toxoplasmosis? Yeah, we don't know a ton about it. I've got a friend who did some work on it in the Pacific Northwest and saw that they're definitely getting infected on to some degree. We don't really know what impact it has on them um, in terms of, you know, does it actually harm them in a, to a significant level? There's been pretty small amount of research done on that. Uh, I mean, in the particular area where he was working, they were highly abundant, so it obviously wasn't wiping them out just yet. Mm -hmm. But that's that's kind of a, a low bar for research success. Like, okay, well, they're still here. <laughs> uh, good. But, you know, there's, there's more to learn. Um, but, yeah, there are more questions than answers there, I'm afraid. Another Zoom attendee asks, how do you lure the otters into those cages? And once in, how do you physically obtain them? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah. So you don't lure them in. You uh, catch them by stealth. Um, and maybe I could I could show you the video. That will tell you better than, than me just telling you. So how about I just do this? Uh, This video is produced by California Fish and Wildlife. Um, using an underwater approach by specially trained divers. There are a small number of specially trained state and federal biologists qualified to capture sea otters. These divers use specialized diving equipment called rebreathers, which do not produce any bubbles. These rebreathers are not available to recreational divers but are a military design that delivers 100% oxygen. The divers don their equipment, enter the water, and surface next to the boat. A diver propulsion vehicle and a large netted trap called a Wilson trap are passed down to them. Each diver connects their trap to the end of their diver propulsion vehicle, does a final check of their gear, and signals they are ready to go. These clandestine divers now begin the long underwater transit to the resting otters they've targeted. During this transit, the lead diver skillfully navigates the diver propulsion vehicle and trap through the kelp forest while maintaining the compass heading to the targets. Biologists on shore and on the boat keep an eye on the resting otters and also watch for the lead diver's head to break through the surface for a head check. The lead diver has a small VHF radio in a pocket on their dive hood and can hear instructions from the shore and boat spotters. This topside information helps the dive team modify their approach if necessary if the otters have changed position or conditions have changed. The lead diver descends and continues to periodically make head checks until the divers can see the target otters and they can stage their underwater approach. Once in position under the resting sea otters, the divers, without bubbles, can study the group and select the primary targets they picked out while on the boat. Once both divers have chosen their targets and have traps in position six to eight feet below the unsuspecting otters, they coordinate their ascent to the surface. The divers power the diver propulsion vehicle while kicking hard, pushing the diver propulsion vehicle and trap through the kelp canopy so the trap will envelop the otter. Once the otter is in the trap, the diver pulls a drawstring, closing the net and securing the otter in the trap. With traps securely holding the otters, both divers then surface and give a hand signal to the boat requesting a pickup. The capture boat quickly zooms into the kelp bed to pick up the divers and captured sea otters. The divers hand up their gear and reboard the boat and the newly captured otters are transferred from the diver traps into large wooden boxes designed specifically to hold and transport otters. Once on shore, a team of scientists including veterinarians, biologists, and assistants prep each otter for sedation and a full medical evaluation. Morphometric data and samples are collected to help increase our knowledge about sea otter morphology, biology, and physiology, 
and each otter is outfitted with colored flipper tags for subsequent identification. A subset of animals receive implanted radio tags, which allow researchers to relocate and monitor these animals intensely from shore using radio receivers and high-powered optics. Capturing wild sea otters provides a way to measure and monitor sea otter health, allowing scientists and resource managers to make informed decisions concerning conservation of this vulnerable species. There you go. That's how you do it. Um, and by no means all sea otter research is done involving captures, but there are certain things that there is just no way to figure out. Um, and some of them pretty cool to sort of conservation and management programs um, without uh, without catching. There's, a, there's not very much sea otter capture work going on these right at the moment, um, but there was, there was quite a bit through the late 90s through to about 2014. Um, yeah. All right, one more. So can you talk a little bit on maybe where you've done your visual and hands-on research with sea otters, maybe the size of that population and what you found yeah. fascinating of the otters? Mm, it's fascinating. Yeah. So I worked uh, mostly in California I uh, with sea otters, I mean. I worked on some data. Uh, we had a lot of data that I used from BC Southeast Alaska, Aleutian, stuff like that. But I didn't, I wouldn't work up there myself personally. I worked on the coast, coast of California um, doing just what you saw in the video. Basically, I was one of the shore vets, right? Dealing with the animals when they came onto shore and working on that disease problem I talked about earlier. That was what I spent most of my attention on for the five years I was in California. Um, most interesting, I think, um, I mean, the fascinating animals to work with uh, a little snappy, um, but I think actually the the kelp forest system is the most interesting part of it in many ways. Um, and it's interesting, it's very dynamic. It changes really quickly. It's not like a forest. Um, you know, you don't see, for example, the tree cover in a forest go from 90% to 10% in six months. Well, not unless someone's logged the whole thing, <laughs> you know, um, not just out of the blue, right? Uh, where you do sometimes in kelp forests. Um, and sometimes it bounces back extremely quickly. You know, you see influxes of all these strange animals showing up when you have maybe a warm water current shows up and you have all these weird little crab things floating around in the water. And yeah, things change really quickly. And they sometimes look much the same on the surface, but as soon as you stick your head underwater, uh things are changing so i think that that whole kelp forest system was probably the most fascinating part about it actually all right well thank you again so much yeah thank you for being here